Okay, welcome everyone to our graduate school panel. Um, this time we are focusing on MBAs. We're super, super excited to have everyone here. Um, my name is Leah, I'm the Client Services Manager with ESM. We are just going to have everyone go around and introduce themselves uh, in just a moment. Please feel free to use the Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, we will do our best to answer all of them. If questions that do not get answered during this session or if something comes up later, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can always reach us at clientservices at esmprep.com. I will add that into the chat so that you can see it. Um, we are recording, so we will send this out as well. Um, but so right now we'll get to it. Uh, Katie, if you want to start and introduce yourself. Sure, absolutely. So my name is Katie Levy. Uh, I'm the CEO, uh, <laughs> as you're talking about client services, uh, CEO and a senior college coach. Uh, and I also do graduate school counseling, which is relevant uh, at ESM. Uh, quick background, grew up on the East Coast, just outside New York City. I uh, went to Princeton uh, for undergrad, uh, worked for four years in financial services by day and education by night. Uh, in New York City, and then went to Tech, graduated in 2014, moved out to California, uh, did one more year in finance, and then joined ESM, and have been here since 2015. Wonderful. Ted? Well, hi, I'm Ted Merguia. I, uh, my quick background is I grew up in Mexico, and then went to undergrad at Stanford, where I majored in engineering. But Ever since I was little, I knew I was going to get an MBA. My mom asked me once, and she just reminded me of the story. I said, oh, I'm going to do that. I didn't, didn't know you could do business. And as soon as I knew, that was it. So I spent three years in consulting in San Francisco and then went to Wharton for business school. Wonderful. Um, Lawrence? Um, hi, I'm Lawrence Anasetti. Um, grew up uh, out here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Ended up going to school in uh, in Massachusetts and in Indiana. Graduated from Rose Holman with a mechanical and aerospace engineering degree. Um, spent some time in industry, um, in manufacturing, uh, large industrial manufacturing metals, chemicals, and uh, trucks at various points. Um, and still tutored all the way through from high school, all the way through my engineering career. Uh, got my MBA at UC Davis while I was working um, in the Sacramento area. Um, and then came on board with ESM in 2014. Um, and now am uh, doing finance and operations for the company here. Great, thank you so much. So, for the first part of this webinar, we'll talk about start, thinking about getting your MBA. Um, what do you need to apply? All those things. So Katie, maybe if you could kick us off. Yep, absolutely. Um, so there's obviously lots of pieces of the application process. Um, just to kind of rattle through them, um, one of the, the historically biggest kind of uh, time intensive pieces is the, the GMAT or the GRE. Um, most uh, business programs nowadays will allow, uh, will accept the GRE and not just the GMAT. Uh, this is something that I did not know when I was applying many years ago. Um, so I like to always, always tell students uh, to check because uh, sometimes if, if students have, have trouble with the GMAT or especially if they don't like the math, some students find the GRE easier. Um, there are, you know, your college transcripts, uh, recommendations normally too. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but generally speaking, they prefer uh, work recommendations, um, uh, interview, sometimes a presentation, um, and essays, the uh, famous essays. The short-term, long-term career goals and why do you want to go here are two that are asked on almost every application and interview uh, in addition. So that's kind of a, a big overview. Ted, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, letters of rec? Sure. <clears throat> so recommendations. Like Katie said, ideally from work, but of course that creates a problem because wherever you're working might not be terribly excited about the fact that you are that you're thinking of leaving. So consider that first. In my case, um, I was in consulting, but it was it was one of the accounting firms, and they were willing to pay for my continuing education. Uh, but if I left, they 
they were going to be upset. So I actually took an accounting class at night um, for a semester, maybe it was a year, hated it. I said, there's no way I can do an MBA this way. So I decided at that point that I, I would leave, but then navigating, getting the letter of recommendation, uh, I ended, I did not go to my direct boss. <clears throat> By luck, I ended up working with uh, a partner in the firm that was much more about mentoring me and, and having me a su have a successful career. And, uh, you know, I took a leap of faith and thought that he would be okay with it. And he was. Uh, so, so that's kind of something to think about. Um, uh, certainly helps if you've had a couple jobs because it's much easier to go to a prior one. Uh, and if you've done some work, uh, you can go all the way back to school too. If in college you were doing some work, um, that can be that that can be a reasonable recommendation as well. Yep. Um, the 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 hardest recommendation I would say to get, just like Ted was saying, is, is they often ask for your direct supervisor. Um, and because of job security, and obviously if you're going to apply to full-time programs, if you ask for that, then they assume you're gone. Um, in my case, I had started in, uh, I started working in 2008 at Lehman Brothers. Uh, we all remember how that went. Um, and so when obviously there were uh, lots of layoffs, unfortunately, um, and so the team just kept getting smaller and smaller. And I didn't feel comfortable asking uh, my direct supervisor either because they I knew I would likely be the next on the chopping block if they knew I wasn't going to hang around. Um, so I asked my my uh, my partner uh, who I sat next to, who was really my mentor, um, and then the the or one of the heads of the team uh, who I had worked closely with, and who really, just like I said, was, was also uh, took on a, a great mentorship capacity for me. Great, thank you. So there's a lot of MBA programs out there. Lawrence, could you talk to us a little bit about how you chose the programs to apply to? Yeah, so I probably chose the most non-traditional program uh, of, of this particular group um, because I was already working full-time. Um, I hadn't saved up or did I have uh, any money uh, to actually go to a, do a full-time program. It didn't really make financial sense for me to do. Um, and I was getting my work to pay for it. So um, I couldn't quit my job and still have them pay for it. Although I tried to pitch the idea, it didn't go over that well. So um, I wanted to stay in the area, obviously, since I had to work. So my choices were UC Davis and, um, and Cal also has a commuter program where you take classes on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, the highlight of those programs though, is that they are not separate programs. You get from their, from their full time you get the same degree that you would get if you went to their full-time program. In fact, when I was at UC Davis, when I started working at ESM and tutoring kids in the evenings and on the weekends um, to make my schedule work, I actually took classes with the full-time kids um, to make it work with my schedule better. So it offered that flexibility. And that's why I ended up going with Davis. Um, commuting back and forth, to Berkeley every single weekend for two or three years. It just didn't end up working with my lifestyle. Um, and Davis was cheaper. They, they sort of were very aggressive in recruiting um, and they locked in your tuition. So no matter how long you took to complete the program, you pay the tuition that you started with um, in terms of, of credit. So all those sort of put together, Davis ended up making the most sense for me. Um, although Haas had, you know, obviously carries a much better brand. Um, but at the time I wasn't looking to, uh, and still am not looking to change companies. Um, um, so it didn't, you know, that didn't matter as much for me if I wanted to go into like finance or consulting or something, Haas might've probably been higher up on the list for me, but that just wasn't the case. So Katie, could you speak to your process a little bit and how you chose your programs? Yep, absolutely. So similar to, to Ted, when I, when I was working, I took an evening class um, in fixed income because uh, I was in that, in that division when I was in sales and trading. And uh, Lawrence, I will always respect you for so many ways, uh, but <laughs> primarily, I don't know how you did it, uh, working a full-time job, sometimes coming 100 hour weeks and doing, and doing classes, I just, I just couldn't do it. 
um, I also knew that if uh, if I had the ability and uh, and I I was a little different in that I wanted to pivot um, and I really wanted to also get that that community that time to expose myself to other uh, non financial careers as well um, or even other kinds of finance I learned a lot about because I had been so narrow in what I did um, so I really you know I read a lot again I didn't feel comfortable really talking to to colleagues about it and so I talked to uh, friends or family members or I just did a lot of research uh, on the different programs and, and uh, I was really going for feel and community. Um, I really loved my undergrad experience and wanted um, kind of a, a broad general, uh, general management program uh, in a place where I could see myself in a, in a community that I got excited to be a part of. Um, so that's very generally, uh, very general kind of overview, but we'll talk uh, later as well, a little bit more specifically. So Katie, what was the hardest part for you about applying for your MBA? Well, gosh, I we were talking about this before we, we started the webinar uh, and on a, or prep call a couple weeks ago. I still have nightmares of studying for the GMAT uh, nights and weekends in my tiny little closet apartment in New York City um, outside of work. Um, so it's, for me, that was the hardest. Um, standardized testing just wasn't naturally my 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 skill set, uh, and so studying when work was already so intense and so stressful, um, and when I didn't feel comfortable talking to to colleagues or or friends about it. So um, for me, just the kind of the guilt when I was hanging out with friends on the weekend that I should be studying, and then the guilt when I was studying that I wasn't. Uh, doing other things. So for me, it was, it was really the GMAT. Um, and I took it once. I probably, I wish I had taken it again, um, but just work had gotten too much. And Lawrence, you touched on this a little bit um, previously, but maybe you could talk a little bit about financing your education and, and how that worked for you. The thing to remember uh, about MBA programs is they're, they're expensive. You know, it's not like other grad school. If I went to graduate school for engineering, they would have paid me $20,000 a year to do the program, right? And be a PhD, you get your little stipend, you're sort of a broke graduate student, but you're not going into debt, right? So for that degree. Uh, and, and MBAs just aren't like that. Um, there's not a whole lot of scholarships. I don't even really know of any off the top of my head. Um, so, you know, the colleges definitely make money off the program. I use, uh, um, my employee benefits and I think employee benefits are kind of interesting because colleges or not colleges, employers can pay a certain amount. I think it's like 5,000 a year, or they might've upped it to 6,000 a year, somewhere in that realm where it's non-taxable for the company. Um, and then they can pay more than that, but a lot of them choose not to, because then, that they have to start paying payroll taxes um, and additional money on top of whatever they're giving you. Um, so uh, my company went up to that tax limit and you know it, it was okay, but that's also why I spread out my degree. So I took, um, th and I also got married, so I saved for a wedding in between there. So I ended up taking like three and a half years um, to finish my MBA, which was fine because I was working the entire time. Um, but it also allowed me to maximize my employer contributions since those are limited by the tax year. Um, so that, and of course, I chose a cheaper program in UC Davis to sort of just make it all work. Um, otherwise, it really just makes sense to work before going into your MBA. There are some kids that go out of college, but you know, getting these top programs, getting those recommendations, and then just being able to save for the program. Um, so you're not coming out of the program with a huge amount of debt and having the pressure to get a really high paying job. Um, Cause you may not want the highest paying job that may not be your dream job, but you don't want to be forced into it uh, because of debt. Thanks. Ted, um, any to add to that? Yeah, well, for, for me, I did have the option of having my employer and there's still some employers uh, that will pay for it. And I considered doing the part-time, lots of very good programs. I know Wharton has 
has a the executive MBA program that can lead to a master's as well. Um, so it's definitely worth checking your benefits. That's absolutely the first thing to do. I looked at mine uh, and took that class and said, there's no way I can do this. Uh, and so I lived a very Spartan life for the three years between college and, uh, and, and when I actually went to the to graduate school. And you know, I was basically living as a college student. I was in a house with six or seven other roommates. I think my rent was probably two or 300 bucks a month. And, and I was in a job that paid very well. So I managed to save a fair amount of money uh, because I did not want to come out with a lot of debt. Um, and then I had, I had the opportunity, well, and I had the luck that, that my mom then stepped up and said, you know, you go, we'll figure it out. And I did take uh, a couple loans out and th those ended up, I had some from Stanford as well. And uh, the good news is that the payments on the Stanford loan stopped when, while I was in, in graduate school. And then when I got out, everything got back. I did, uh, for me, I did take the high paying job. Um, although most of my classmates went to Wall Street, I went out to Silicon Valley and ended up at, at, at what was in Sun Microsystems. And really that ended up being an easy payoff of, of the loans. Um, it also probably helped that I married well because I married a classmate of mine at, at Wharton. And so we both had great jobs. Um, so, so that's the way I financed it, um, and, and, and actually I'm very glad I did that. The, I try to minimize the loans as much as possible. Great, thank you. So before we move on to our next section with his in grad school, which is exciting, Katie, what is a piece of advice that you would give to someone who is applying to grad school now, applying to an MBA program? Yep, great question. So like I was mentioning before, one of the questions that you will always get asked in uh, essays, interviews, any conversation is what are your short-term and long-term career goals? Um, and what I always say is, you know, nobody gets excited about that, that first job out of school. You get excited about the stepping stone to your dream job, whether it's five, 10, however many years later, um, hopefully sooner than that. But what I always say is, is think about that dream job, think about your life after school where you want that to be and what you want that to look like and choose your programs and choose your short-term career goals based off of that. Um, and specifically, I think one thing that, that I didn't quite realize is, um, so I went to talk uh, at Dartmouth and, and I loved my experience. I, I would never change anything in the whole world, but um, I realized uh, once I got there that because it's in the middle of nowhere, uh, a b very beautiful middle of nowhere in the middle of the woods in the Upper Valley, um, you know, pretty much the only companies that came to recruit were uh, very large ones. Um, and so you had, the, you had the banks, you had the consulting companies, you had some tech, um, but mostly East Coast and even mostly Boston. Um, and, so, and I knew going in that I wanted to um, go out to California, uh, get some sunshine after a long time in New York City. Um, and it was, it was pretty hard for me to, to navigate um, trying to get my career of choice and, um, and switch to California because not many people were recruiting from there. Um, about half of my class or even more ended up in Boston after grad school. Thank you. As a New Englander, I can attest to how cold it is and wanting to come out to California. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so now we are in graduate school. You have chosen your program. You are in. Um, Ted, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit about the fun parts of grad school. So, you know, we've talked about money and, and how hard studying is, but grad school and M MBA programs can be fun. So maybe tell us about that. No, it was, it's not can be fun. They're absolutely fun. Um, I, the toughest part was getting in. <laughs> and then uh, it was, it was a very, very social um, community. I mean, you end up group the first years we were all together and and uh we ended up we ended up in cohorts and those cohorts still stick the reunions just went to a reunion we had a virtual one and those cohorts are still part of the social um glue that binds us together um i went in specifically with the goal uh not to try to get all of ds's in our case distinguished was the highest rate you could get um, because I was there to meet people. I was there to understand how this group work and, and, 
what made us all tick. And so for me, the networking was a big, big part of it. And I think that was true for many of my classmates because very few would just study a lot. Um, it was very social and I love that part of it. And I, I still do. I, I really, I think I made a very good decision not to try to get there. And my whole life had been get all A's all the time. And this was like, no, okay, we're going to do something else. And that, and it did free up a lot of time. That worked out really well. Loved it. Awesome. Katie, same question. What was fun about tech? Oh gosh, everything. Um, uh, you know, just going off of, off of what Ted was saying, like we had fun. It was awesome. You got to meet people from all over the world with cool stories and um, kind hearts and just, you know, people were so excited to be there. Um, partly because it was an amazing place and we were learning so much and getting to meet so many cool people, but also we knew much how what working was like and we were really happy to not be working <laughs> and to be back in school. So we appreciated that time together. Um, you know, we did tripod hockey and we were all horrible, but it was so much fun uh, getting to know people in a, in a different way. Um, but I would say academically thinking, um, you know, my job beforehand had been so narrow. I sold fixed income, U.S. denominated securities to, to a very specific type of client base around the world. That is, that is very, very, very narrow, even within the finance world. Um, and so I had never, you know, my undergrad was in humanities, so I studied politics. We didn't have business at Princeton. And so, you know, I had never taken an accounting class. I'd never even really taken a finance class in undergrad, ironically. Uh, didn't know the first thing about marketing or uh, you name it, I didn't know anything. Um, and so thinking, being able to think more broadly about, okay, here's a problem. Um, how would you attack it? Um, and so, you know, having that perspective, not only um, within different types of industries and thinking, but also globally, you know, how, it, how would uh, somebody from Russia view this? Okay, I have a, I have a, a good friend who I went to Peru with, uh, how would he think about it? Um, and so it just kind of humanizes um, how you think about global challenges. Great. So of course, the flip side of that is there are some difficulties in grad school. Uh, Lawrence, can you tell us about that? Yeah, so particularly in the part-time program, you know, you're working full-time um, and everybody else, you know, presumably in that program is working full-time or working a job. So I was working two jobs at the time. I was working at ESM and I was still working at the, at the factory. Um, so my days would start at 4 a.m. and then I'd tutor after that, getting off at three, and then I'd have class at six, and I'd get home at nine um, on days that I had school. So it was very busy, um, and not everybody, everything's group work in your, in your MBA, um, and not everybody is as respectful of your time as, you know, as everybody else. So you kind of have to deal with those group dynamics, particularly when I took classes with the full-time kids who didn't have jobs and who were living on campus and who were drinking during group meetings and having fun and everything was a good old time. And I say, guys, I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning for work. So we need, you know, I got 30 minutes and that's it. Like that's the end of our group meeting today. Um, so that was a struggle for me because I was always tired. I was always cranky. <laughs> um, but it also teaches you a lot of skills. It teaches you, you know, those group dynamics and having, having to work with people and having to teach them and having to relay uh, how you're feeling and still get a lot of work done. Um, so there's a lot of learning there. Um, but that was the biggest thing for me. It's just, especially those group meetings, they can go on forever if nobody is managing them. Like somebody needs to step up and be a leader and sort of be the taskmaster. It, you can have fun doing it. Uh, but particularly when you're in a part-time program, and a lot of these people in the part-time program had kids, which I couldn't imagine. You know, I have two young ones now. You know, there are people that were having babies and having kids or had young kids at home, and they're, you know, going to school at night, working during the day, um, and still having to meet with the group and still getting all their assignments done. Um, so the biggest thing for me by far was time. Absolutely. So Katie, as a full-time student, what were the challenges for you? Yeah, um, for me, I would say two things kind of uh, segueing off of both what Ted and, and Lauren said. Um, 
uh, definitely resonates with me what Ted was talking about. For me, um, you know, in undergrad, I, I just in high school, I, you know, worked so hard and grades were so important and, and I wanted to learn everything. And, and so, you know, academics were really my priority. And at Tech, you know, I had the, I had the good fortune of, of having that, that strong academic background. And, and um, so for me, GPA was, you know, at Tech, we, we had fake grades, so it didn't really matter. Um, but I had, I had just kind of figuring out what my priorities were. Um, People used to say you can you can uh, have fun, you can study, or you can sleep, but you can't do all three. Um, <laughs> and so, kind of picking where that is. And I remember thinking, oh, I have accounting homework that's due tomorrow, but it's also my friend's uh, birthday. And shifting that mindset to college, me would absolutely say, oh, I'm going to do my accounting homework. You know, we had no accounting classes. Um, but actually, in at in business school, you know networking and, and building those relationships and understanding kind of how, what different careers are like in different roles. Like that for me was my, was a slightly higher priority. Whereas some of my friends, you know, they, they really want, went there to learn. They knew what they wanted to focus on and they, they studied those academics. So whatever your priority, um, you know, just focus on that. Um, the other quick thing is, is I remember in our, in our, when they kicked off our study groups, I think the first week of school, they, they had this, this person come and they said, uh, you're either a people person, a product person, or a process person. Um, and so, so people, they're like, who, who considers them themselves people, people, uh, and everybody's high-fiving each other. And they're like, yeah, we're awesome. You know, getting excited about the, the people dynamic, uh, process is you're very focused on, okay, we have to do this step and then this step and, and Lawrence and I, I love that now product is let's get, let's get this done. We have a, we have a group project due tomorrow. It's, it's midnight. We got to get this in. Um, and so figuring out kind of what your primary um, uh, preferred work pro kind of process is, um, and then also figuring out how to work with people who have different preferred methods uh, was very uh, difficult at first. But once you kind of understood that, it made it a lot easier. Great. Okay, so you find yourself at the towards the end of grad school or maybe the end of grad school, how do you balance applying for jobs while you're in school or maybe after, right after? Um, Katie, you wanna keep going? Yeah, I'll make, I'll make this quick. Basically, you're, as soon as you get to school, your, your job is to get a job. Uh, so very quickly, uh, I remember Tech was really proud that they didn't let recruiters on campus for the first week of classes. Um, and that was like a, that was a big deal. Um, so very quickly it becomes, uh, yes, you do classes. Yes, you learn all this, this great information and have fun learning that, but, uh, it's, it's a, it's almost even more time figuring out what you want to do, where you want to do it, how you want to do that, um, and figuring that out. So it's, it's a, for me, it was figuring out what I wanted to do, um, and then, you know, building those connections and building those relationships with, with companies it took a lot of time. Great. Uh, one week. Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's wild. Uh, Lawrence, uh, same question. How do you balance all that? I uh, think the biggest thing, piece of advice I can give around that is always be looking. I mean, day one, when you step in, part of it's not just the degree and the classes at the MBA, right? It's the networking and getting to know people. So you're asking around what other people are doing. Can you meet people in those companies, particularly if you're interested in an industry? You don't wait until the last semester of school to start looking for a job. Get established with your career services, do mock interviews, um, know who to go to for what. Um, that way, you know, when, when it's time, you can even secure a job a year before you graduate if you know the right people, right? So it's just, it's about really getting to know people and starting early and not having to do all the work at one time. Okay, you've graduated, got that job. Uh, Ted, tell us a little bit about what your, some maybe some of what your classmates did after school, maybe some common job opportunities for someone with an MBA. Well, and I'm gonna pick up right where Lawrence left off because one of the things I did when I got there is I got to know the second years. Um, and that ends up helping a lot for the mm -hmm. jobs because then you can call them the next year and say, hey, or they can even recommend you. Um, so so that's, um, that's what I did. I ended up um, 
in Silicon Valley, I always, I'm in Silicon Valley, I love tech. I knew I wanted to be played with the toys. Um, but the, uh, uh, and the vast majority of my class, however, went to New York and they're mostly still there. Now they're in the suburbs with families and their kids are going to college. But um, it was the recruiting at Wharton from New York was intense. Uh, the day Goldman came, it was a big deal. And who went to dinner with them was a big deal. Um, but my wife and I both ended up in marketing in high tech. Um, I had one of my classmates that was actually nominated for uh, an Oscar because she's a producer in Hollywood. And uh, so she produced a book. And um, I have a, a couple that actually did a JD MBA and they are now financial consultants, um, actually, yeah, they both have financial consulting firms on their own. And what's interesting is now that I'm old enough, MBA teaches you how to be a CEO. And it took a while, but eventually a whole bunch of my classmates became CEOs of, of their company, which was pretty fun. Amazing. So can vouch for that, it's very fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for being a wonderful ceo katie i'm glad you were trained to be <laughs> so great um so perhaps if you are not aiming for C for a ceo position uh lawrence maybe what did your classmates do any yeah so a, a lot a lot of different things um i actually focused on analytics and business analytics and marketing while i was at the program um and this is, now they have a big data concentration as well. So this is pre big data, you know, just by a year. Um, but a lot of kids went into that. Um, they're working at the, you know, I have a friend that works at Stripe doing data analytics, a lot of data scientists. Um, that was a big thing. At UC Davis, a lot of people go into the wine industry. Um, and that's, that's a really, really big program there. Intel is also a really big um, employer in the Sacramento area. So a lot of people are looking to move up within their jobs um, at Intel, mostly director level jobs or uh, product lead type jobs. Um, I think there was a good amount of uh, marketing directors and product managers that, you know, that, that was what they're trying to get their MBA for is they're working for a company and they wanted to head up their product division. And so it sort of gave them an, the edge in terms of grabbing one of those positions. Um, but there are a lot, it's very, very broad. Um, the one thing I would say is to sort of have a plan, you know, have an idea of where you wanna you know what your trajectory is gonna be. It doesn't have to be, but you want to be moving forward. The last thing you wanna do is get this MBA and then do nothing with it. Because even for me, the data analytics I learned, I. I haven't used it, right? That part of my MBA, and now it's gone because the technology has changed. So language has changed, the program has changed. Um, so you do have a little bit of a finite amount of time, um, you know, with once you get your degree and what you're gonna do with it. So Laura, that actually leads me very nicely into my next question, which if you are not using data analytics, what do you use in your daily life that you learned in your MBA program? So everything else, I guess you can say. Uh, everything else I did not concentrate on in school. Um, I, uh, so I'm the CFO, so obviously a ton of accounting is what I do right now. Um, I manage operations in the company, so corporate structures, um, uh, management is just really general management, um, corporate finance, uh, marketing, digital marketing, which was fun. I really enjoyed all of those classes and I get to use a little bit of that now, although we're still very much starting out on that here at ESM. Um, but a lot of it is relevant, but I think the biggest thing is working with people. At the end of the day, working with interdisciplinary groups of people and getting them all together to achieve some measure of success, right? Especially when you're the CFO or the CEO or anybody um, in the C-suite, it's not like you specialize in one thing. Um, even if you're the CFO, you don't just do accounting. You have to work with all of the other groups of people and all of the other teams in the company um, and be on the same page and make sure that everybody's aligned 
um, on the mission or on your purpose or, or whatever it is. Great, thank you. And Katie, our CEO, which you <laughs> underwent training, what else do you, <laughs> what else do you use your MBA for in your daily life? Well, other than uh, in our family telling my husband that I got a, a degree in delegation and management uh, and using that to ask him to take the garbage out. Um, <laughs> no, but, but on a real note, couldn't, couldn't echo more uh, what, uh, what Lawrence was saying, that um, being able to, I think most importantly, connect with different types of people and different uh, and people who think differently um, I don't think I would be able to do this job um, had I not gotten that exposure to all those different verticals, all those different types of people. Um, it's, it's just been incredible to kind of have that different kind of perspective, um, I think, and, and you know, communicating. Um, so we do, you know, obviously a lot of presentations and, and kind of the, the classic sense of, of presenting or communication, um, but we took a ton of classes and uh, in managerial communication um, and giving speeches and, and conveying your points and, and you know, everything from how to build a slide deck, but more importantly, to how to convey your message um, and how to really focus on the mission. Um, and that's one thing that, that I think we, we at least try to do really well here is we focus on the mission uh, in every form of communication. So educating, um, you know, taking that stress out, helping, helping students and applicants achieve those goals. That, wholeheartedly is our mission here and and we try to convey that in in all forms of communication wonderful well thanks everybody um ted i'll have you start off with a final words of wisdom for those who are looking at some mba programs well i'll go back to the first question you asked me which is about financial aid when we landed at Wharton the first first day, freshman, uh, first year orientation, they asked us, how many of you thought you made a good financial decision by going to business school? So everybody raises their hand. And then he walked us through the math. Um, and that's something that you should do, walk through the math. Because if you are going to lose two years of income and pay a couple hundred thousand dollars, you might be making a really big decision here. Uh, and just it's fine. It, in my case, in fact, for all my classmates, absolutely worth it. Um, but think about it because I hadn't, I thought it's like, yeah, of course, this is going to be great. And it's, uh, it's worth thinking about. Katie, same question. Uh, really, truly uh, write down what your priorities are. Um, a, in a school uh, and B, uh, in a in a job because you're going to get offers and you're going to get pushed into different paths um, and different paths are going to be easier than others and uh, I'm, I I fell into that trap they you know a job similar to the one I had going in rolled out the red carpet for me and they said we want you and I said oh great I can either take this great job and, and pay off a lot of the school or I can go into this amorphous really difficult uh, try to get a job there. And, and I said, yes, I think too easily. Um, so write down your need to have, your want to have in any job that you uh, want, um, because that's a lot, of, that's a big piece of, of grad school. Um, and most importantly, have fun. Enjoy the people you meet. Um, they're, they're some of my best, best friends and, and lifetime friends um, who have gone there and, and you go through so many wonderful experiences with them. So enjoy it, enjoy the learning, enjoy the people. Um, just enjoy that time. Okay, Lawrence, your final words of wisdom. Um, have a plan. Like just sort of echoing what Ted said, um, a little bit what Katie said too, is just go in with a plan because this is not a degree that you that you get passively, you know. A lot of a lot of people, you go to college, you don't really know what you're gonna do. you you get to find yourself, it's four years. You have to switch majors, right? There's that flexibility. You don't do that with business school. You don't go in just like, oh, I have nothing better to do. So let me waste uh, $175,000 and two years of time and income. Like it, it can, you know, I do know some people where business school just, it wasn't worth it for them. It didn't make sense for them to do it. They just had no idea because, you know, I graduated in the recession um, and some people were just looking for things to do. 
Um, this is not one of those things. Um, that's not to say that your plans can't change, but look at the classes, look at the concentrations, look at the travel opportunities, the internship opportunities, um, and have an idea of what you want to do when you're getting out. That way you're actively working toward it the entire time you're at business school. Um, and and you'll, you'll get a much more, um, you'll have a much more successful experience. You'll be much happier there. And you won't have as much to worry about when you get out as well. Wonderful. So if anyone has any questions, you'll see the little Q&A um, button down the bottom. Please feel free to use that. We'll give you a second to type your questions. Cue the Jeopardy music. <laughs> Or did we just cover everything so well? <laughs> Absolutely. Complete. <laughs> so I'm not seeing any questions coming in, um, but we are available to you um, if something comes up. Please send us an email. You can send it directly to me to client services at esmprep.com. Um, I will get it to the right person. We are always available to you. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you so much for our attendees for joining this. Uh, these are really fun. And I hope you learned a lot. And we're here for you to guide you. And thanks for joining. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>